In this video, I am going to be going over chapter 18, the heart. The heart is located in the mediastinum, deep to the sternum, medial to the lungs, and superior to the diaphragm. There are three layers that surround the heart. There is the fibrous layer, which is the tough outer layer, the parietal layer, which is under the fibrous layer, and the visceral layer, which is around the heart itself. The visceral layer is also called the epicardium, which we will get to next. Between the parietal and visceral layer is the pericardial cavity. This cavity is there to reduce surface tension and provide lubrication. Next, we have the epicardium. The epicardium is made up of simple squamous epithelium, and it also makes serous fluid. Then it's the myocardium, which is made up of cardiac muscle. And lastly, there is the endocardium, which is the inner lining of the heart, and that is made of simple squamous epithelium. It also helps smooth out blood flow. Now we have all the parts of the heart and how the blood flows through them. Firstly, there are four chambers, the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. Then there are four valves. There's the tricuspid valve, which is between the right atrium and left ventricle. And on the other side, we have the bicuspid or mitral valve, which is between the left atrium and left ventricle. Between the right ventricle and pulmonary trunk, there's the pulmonary semilunar valve. And between the left ventricle and aorta, there's the aortic semilunar valve. Now for all the little pieces. Here we have chordae tendinae. These fibers hold on, are what hold on to the tricuspid and bicu bicuspid valves and allow them to open and close. The tendinae are attached to papillary muscles, which are projections that pull on the chordae tendinae and make them move. Then there's the fossa ovalis, which is just an oval shaped depression and tuberculae carnae, which are muscle ridges in the ventricles. Now for the blood flow. The superior vena cava brings blood from the body above the diaphragm, and the inferior vena cava brings blood from the body below the diaphragm. Both dump blood into the right atrium, which is oxygen poor. The blood then moves through the tricuspid valve and into the left ventricle, still oxygen poor. After that, it goes through the pulmonary semilunar valve and into the pulmonary trunk. Once there, the blood goes into the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. When the blood comes back through the pulmonary veins, it is now oxygen rich. The pulmonary veins dump blood into the left atrium. The blood then moves through the bicuspid valve and into the left ventricle. After that, it goes through the aortic semilunar valve and into the aorta. The oxygen rich blood travels out through the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery into the body where it will be circulated and brought back to the heart where the process will start all over. Now we have the coronary arteries. We will start with the left coronary artery. This feeds the circumflex artery and the anterior interventricular artery. The circumflex artery feeds the left atrium and posterior part of the left ventricle, and the anterior interventricular artery supplies the anterior walls of both ventricles and interventricular septum. The right coronary artery feeds the marginal artery and the posterior interventricular artery.
The marginal artery feeds the lateral part of the right side of the heart and the posterior intraventricular artery feeds the remaining part of the posterior ventricles. Next up are the coronary veins. The cardiac veins collect blood from the heart. The great cardiac vein collects blood from the anterior ventricular septum. The middle cardiac vein gets blood from the posterior interventricular septum. The small cardiac vein gets blood from the right inferior margin and the anterior cardiac vein gets blood from the right ventricle. And finally, the coronary sinus brings blood back to the right atrium. Now on to the intrinsic system. This system tells your heart to beat and sets the basic rhythm. It all starts with the sinoatrial node or SA node. The SA node is your heart's pacemaker. It makes atrial contractions. From there, the impulse moves to the atrial ventricular node or AV node. Here, there is a time delay. The AV node catches the impulse, holds onto it for a second, and then sends it to the bundle of hiss. The bundle of hiss then splits off into the right and left bundle branches. These branches extend down to the apex. Once there, the impulse reaches the Purkinje fibers. These fibers fire at the walls of the ventricles and tell them to contract. This happens every time your heart beats. To go along with your heartbeat, we have an electrical cardiography or EKG. This diagram shows when atrial and ventricles are contracting and relaxing. It all starts with the P wave. This shows your atrial contraction. It then moves to the PQ interval, which is the time from atrial excitation to the ventral excitation. Next up is the QRX complex which is your ventricle contraction. From there, it moves to the QT interval, which is the beginning of ventricles contraction to the beginning of ventricle relaxing. And finally, it ends with the T wave, which is your ventricle relaxation. From here, it starts all over again with every beat of your heart. The next thing I'm going to talk about are the sounds of the heart. If you've ever listened to a beating heart, you know that it has a lub-dub sound to it. These sounds are called S1 and S2. S1, also known as the lub, happens when the tricuspid and mitral valves are closing, which is the beginning of systole or contraction. The S2 or the dub sound comes from the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves closing. That happens at the end of contraction and the beginning of distally or relaxation. So the next time you are listening to a beating part, just remember that those sounds you hear are actually the valves of the heart closing. Now that you know the fundamentals of the heart, the last thing I'm going to talk about are some clinical problems. Let me first start by saying that a high level of sodium will increase your heart rate and a high level of potassium will stop your heart altogether. These are just a couple of regulations that you should know. Now on to clinical problems. First we have tachycardia, which is a heart rate over 100 beats per minute. Then we have bradycardia, which slows the heart rate 
under 60 beats per minute. Next up is arteriosclerosis, which are clogged arteries. And finally, there is congestive heart failure, which is where the heart can't pump enough blood to keep your body running. That is all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed watching my video and learning about the heart. Thank you.